that. We'll call the meeting to order. We can stand to the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for everyone for coming. So do we have any business on the computer sign in? We do not. Okay. Um, then we'll move right into report of board and committee. Mrs. Ernst. Um, we had a social emotional learning committee meeting um, last week. Thank you, Trevor, with the day to see stage of back to school happening. But uh, it's always so amazing to see how much time and energy the teachers and the administration are putting into making the back to school process as seamless for students that haven't been in school for an entire year, as well as kids who have been in school and are coming back from hybrid. Um, it's been a lot of work um, making sure, this particular time we spent a lot of time making sure that the teachers had um, resources available to them in a logical place where they could find it quickly. Um, and so there was a lot of um, breaking down into small groups and trying to find those resources and to put them all in one um, place where, like I said, so the teachers could find it quickly and easily so that they can address the needs of the kids as well as possible. It's, I mean, the amount of time and energy that's been put into it is really staggering, but the work that's come out of it is clearly um, going to help the transition back to school be as smooth as possible. Thank you. Do we have any other updates? Uh, we did meet our um, with the small way of health and safety committee, um, and we got to be met throughout the month of August, just um, forming the plans that were eventually within the town hall. to uh, tour all of our schools um, with a particular focus on the high school and phase three of our capital construction project. So I'm pleased to welcome our folks from Turner Construction as well as Young and Wright Architecture for an update on phase three construction um, as well as uh, Mr. Rampato, our director of facilities. Welcome. of this work um, through, well, really I've been here since 2017 actually. Um, so we're just wrapping up the remainder of this capital project. Just want to give you guys an update on some of the pieces that we're focused on primarily this summer. Um, so under our phase two project, these right here are the new stairwell do doors that were installed. Um, these were heavily involved with, between the design team, um, Shippo, who uh, has had wanted it to meet the historic, um, the old historic ways that it looked. So between the design team and working with the contractors, um, there was a lot involved to ensure that these doors work properly. Um, so you can see some similarities in how they were prior to when we started construction. These actually go back to what they were um, originally looking like when the building was first opened. Over here we have the um, terrazzo floor refinishing. So during the walkthrough we did take a look at some of the upgrades even from when we did our work to what now the custodians are working on doing um, and adding an additional coat of polish to shine it up even more. Um, but the contractors took it down to bare aggregate, stripped it, cleaned it, and then um, put new sealer on it to really freshen it up. Um, there were years of wax that had accumulated and we were really able to bring them back to restore them to what they, um, how they were installed over 90 years ago. Um, so we, this, the focus was this summer on the stairwells in particular. All right, so 
just want to bring you back to what the ceramics room looked like. I know for those of you who did walk through the new space, um, you can see where we are right now with it and how different it does look. Um, so the floors were almost like a poured concrete asphaltic material um, that were painted many times over the years. Um, tons of exposed mechanicals with insulation that was deteriorating. Um, steam tile, things of that sort. So now that you've walked those spaces and see where we've got it to, um, this is a much cleaner, brighter space, fresh paint. Um, the instructional space, as we talked about during the walkthrough, has changed up quite a bit. So there's now a, a, partition, a movable partition that will separate classroom space versus um, working space for them. So a, a, just a brand new type of room for that department. Um, and this just over here on the left hand side is part of the flooring process. Um, so a moisture mitigation barrier is placed down and that helps for your floor to actually last a lot longer. You won't see bubbling through it. Um, so one of those things that we did throughout actually the entire basement area. Um, and generally it's a good practice to do it um, really on any slab. All right, this is the basement corridor. So brand new, everything is painted. Um, the lockers were actually re, uh, removed and reinstalled new in the phase two project. The phase three was more of the um, ceiling work. There's crown molding, fresh paint, and then upgraded speaker systems and uh, fire alarm as well. Um, and then the linear lighting was eliminated. Now we have two by twos. So. Um, for those of you guys who did walk through, you can see over on this side, um, that's the moisture barrier. That picture was taken just a few days ago. And you can already see we're in the process of we installed a top coat where the floor will then, the top coat, or sorry, the marmolian floor will be installed too. Um, so just in a couple of days, you can see the quick process that happens towards the end. This is the old high school computer lab innovation room. Um, this is more so the temporary space that was made uh, as far as the seating and table layout. Um, while we jumped ahead on construction activities in the um, early spring. So just to get an idea of what the walls looked like, the floors, um, just older tile, a lot of craft materials, um, old lighting, plaster ceilings, so now in the new spaces, like I said before, a lot brighter. Um, I know it's a little difficult to tell, but there is carpet here for those of you who did it to the walkthrough. Um, so just a softer sound space, it won't be as loud. Um, and then over in this room here, so this picture taken four days ago, you can see as Mark said in the um, walkthrough, we didn't have carpet, we didn't have base, no cabinetry. So things are really gonna pick up in the next few days here, wrapping up these spaces. All right, and the technology room. So you can see some of the original equipment that is uh, that was in the space that will now get moved over into the new space. Um, so there'll be, this is, uh, the technology in Woodshop area has been reconfigured in the design process. So although this is the same room as what you're seeing here, the way the room is going to work in the classroom setting is different. Um, Mark also mentioned the technology is a cleaner working space, so your CNC machine, your spray booth, um, whereas before it was a lot of the woodworking, lumber storage, um, cutting and things of that sort. And just wanted to give you a quick update because I think from the last report that we did back in June, uh, at that time we were working on removing the hydraulic lift that was found in the wood shop. Um, so since then, new concrete floor had been installed over there. That's the guys working on um, putting that in. And over here on the left hand side, this is just what it looks like before. Some of the tables that are laid out here, but everything got brand new coat of paint. Um, it's really gonna get freshened up. We didn't have a great picture of it for this report um, just because we actually pulled up the temporary protection today. So you can see that's the new concrete. 
that went down. Floor protections here, but today it completely cleared out and cleaned up. And then there'll be furniture getting moved in on Saturday. Does anybody have any questions? this time last year in making sure that we've kept ahead of the curve and up to date on things and where you know the hybrid instructional model um, offered some negatives for our students and, and our community because of the you know the, the um, lack of attendance in school one of the benefits it afforded us was to get ahead of our construction project which allowed us to go out early uh, and really make sure that we're ready for this school year um, with phase three. So great job, team. I know it's been a lot of work behind the scenes getting to this point, and um, it's, it looks great, and I can't wait for our students to enjoy it. Well, on that note, um, I'd like to provide you with an update on our COVID-19 health and safety plan. Uh, Mrs. McLaughlin mentioned uh, a little bit of our committee uh, structure, which I'm really proud of. Um, I'd be, you guys are leaving? <laughs> I, I'd be, you know, lying to you if I told you I thought we would be here this year, right now. Um, a year ago when we did this, I expected that as we got to this point, um, for the following school year, we'd be in a much different place. but. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're not, and so we are prepared. That's the good news. So a little bit of, about our structure. Um, again, we put together six committees in our district that focus on health and safety, teaching and learning, as well as um, social emotional well-being of our students and staff. And with these six committees, we had almost 70 people, not only from our school community, but the community at large, uh, stakeholders involved in putting together our plans. Guidance, um, very interesting uh, journey we've been on with guidance. So fortunately, um, patience is not one of my virtues, but it benefited us in this situation because we started our planning really at the um, end of May, early June last year for this upcoming year. So we were using CDC guidance, we were using um, the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance, and we were planning for multiple scenarios, um, waiting to see what was going to happen with New York State's guidance. Um, unfortunately, we were told late in the summer, um, in August, that New York State Department of Health was not going to provide us with guidelines like they did a summer ago and that we should follow the CDC guidance um, and rely on our local, um, you know, local departments of health. So the Erie County Department of Health met with several school leaders throughout the county to get feedback from the field, um, you know, structured around the CDC guidelines, and they were able to put forward some guidelines and, mand and mandates for us um, as we finished off our plans at the end of August. So that came out August 23rd, and I will tell you with the new governor taking over, I don't think we're done with um, updates to what the school is going to look like, even though the school is getting ready to open across the state, and uh, some of them this week and most of them next week. Um, the, the governor has hinted in press conferences and um, testing requirements for staff, um, you know, staff that's not vaccinated, that they submit to weekly tests. She mentioned that today um, while she was at UB. Uh, she's also, um, last Friday, issued a statewide mask mandate for all schools, public, private, and charter within the state. Um, and she's mentioned that there may be some more information forthcoming relative to guidelines from her or the State Department of Health. Um, it sounds like the governor's emergency powers running out in June are withholding her up so she's looking, according to what I heard today, 
be looking into the legal means with which she can require some health and safety measures within the schools. So that will certainly keep us nimble and certainly keep us on our toes. Um, she did not disappoint, um, kept, in, kept the tradition alive that her predecessor had of dropping guidance for schools at 6 o'clock on a Friday night. Um, that's when we got the mask mandate last week. And then there was information in there that was inaccurate, so all weekend we had people swirling about you know, what actually it meant. And finally, um, we came to the place that we got to in this plan. Our plan is pretty all-encompassing. It covers everything from health and safety, teaching and learning, how we're going to address kids that are quarantined, how we're going to address kids that are symptomatic, how we're going to address kids that have long-term illness, technology, social emotional well-being, transportation, food service. Um, you'll hear about it all tonight. Um, our, our, our communication will continue to be uh, primarily through email. Um, we will use our text messaging system if necessary. Um, we also have a website that I'd like to draw your attention to. Um, the COVID-19 section of our website, which if you go to the home page is right here on the top. Um, the plan for our, our plan is uh, up here on a quick link. And there's resources here. And I will highlight that we have our COVID-19 dashboard where you can keep up to date in real time on um, confirmed cases that we have in our district. So we have two up there. Um, we had a student um, that we found out tested positive um, on Monday. And then we had a teacher, um, staff member, employee that we found out today um, had tested positive. So we were able to dust off our contact tracing protocols, and we were able to make sure that we're working them through, and we anticipate with the way things are trending now um, that we're going to be working on this for some time. So I do not plan to send daily emails to people like we did in the beginning, um, but I did email everybody to let them know this dashboard will be kept up to date in real time. And anyone that's identified as a close contact through contact tracing will be contacted directly. Um, so that's just a little bit about communication. And of course, we have our social media accounts too, which are very active. So this is sort of a broad 30,000 foot view of our plan. Um, you know, it, it, the basic principles within the plan include universal masking indoors for all students, staff, and visitors, and on school buses. Uh, physical distancing as a rule at uh, three feet at minimum. There are some instances you'll hear about where we'll be at six feet. Um, Vaccination is encouraged for all eligible um, people, and we have a link on our website to the Erie County Department of Health schedule if you're looking for um, a vaccination appointment. Testing, the Erie County Department of Health and possibly the governor, our governor are offering testing. Right now, we've expressed interest in the testing program, but we don't have details yet. But I will say that there's two forms of testing that they're offering, proximal contact testing and surveillance testing. So surveillance testing would be 10% random sample of your unvaccinated population, um, and that would just be done weekly, 10% of that population. And then the proximal contact testing would be anyone that's not a close contact. So if you have a confirmed case, let's say we have a confirmed case at this meeting tonight, and we found out tomorrow that I tested positive. Um, I'm not within six feet of any of you, we're all masked, so none of you would be close contacts, but you would all be considered under this definition proximal contacts, because you were in the same room during the time that the infected individual was here. So the proximal contact testing would be pretty much everyone in the room that's not the infected individual or the close contacts. Um, again, I would highlight that this is not up and running yet. We're working with the county. They're going to designate, from what we've been told, a medical professional to each district that, was, that expressed interest. And that medical professional will conduct the testing and the sample collection in the schools and work to get it to the lab at UB South um, for running the tests. I will highlight an important point. No student will be tested without consent from their parents. So once we have more information, we will put it out to parents. We'll, we'll ask them to consent 
And then when those testing programs are implemented, they would go to the list of consented individuals, and only those people would be included in the surveillance and proximal contact test. Uh, we think it would be beneficial, so we're going to encourage people to consent, but it's a personal choice. Um, and we're told the test that will be used is a minimally invasive test. There will be a cheap saliva swab that's self-administered by anyone ages three years or up. Um, and again, we would notify parents prior to the test being done, and we would only test people with, that we have consent. So not to worry there. Um, you know, we do have our daily screening temperature checks upon arrival, and we'll be sending reminders to parents to check their kids for symptoms before sending them to school. We want people to stay home when they're sick. We think we have a good plan to allow people to continue with their education if they stay home when they're sick. You heard a lot about the increased ventilation in our classrooms with our MERV 13 filters and the DFS technology air purifiers. And of course, we'll continue with daily cleaning and disinfecting. Mr. Bell Isle is here to talk a little bit about the staffing we added. Where do you want us to go? You're fine right there. I'm trying to follow the camera. Okay. Um, so we'll get your good side. Yeah, right? Right here. Um, <laughs> so obviously, all the components of a, of a good health and safety plan require people to help support and make sure it happens with efficacy and development, right? So um, some of the additional staffing uh, components that we have to address health and safety you see listed there. Under per professionals, it's essentially six building aids as well as an additional hour for some of our part time aids to help implement some of the uh, supports that Mr. Pennell was referencing. For example, um, student supervision, health screening, um, temperature screening protocols, et cetera, throughout the day. And of course, we have some students eating lunch different spaces so it's because we're spreading them out. So those aids are lending a huge hand in helping make sure that happens safely throughout a school day in all four of our buildings. The second you see there are nurse, our nursing faculty, we will again be having an additional nurse in each building. That nurse will be assigned to the nurse's office and they will then again still have the care room separate from the nurse's office. So that will continue this year. They will of course also be helping with some of the COVID protocols that we're required to follow, including some of those that Mr. Pennell is referencing just now. The last chunk you see up there are the cleaners. So we have six additional cleaners coming on staff similar to last year. And two will be at each of our secondary buildings, given the size of those buildings, as well as one in each elementary, in addition to our current staff, of course. They will be primarily assigned a second shift to help with cleaning and sanitization during the evening to make sure the buildings are clean and safe, um, day in and day out. The additional staffing reference there, we're gonna go more into throughout the presentation, so you'll see some additional SEL staff, as well as some teaching and learning staff, but I'll go into some of those with the SEL, and Dr. Shanahan will go into a little bit more detail with the teaching and learning. And as you can see, you'll, you'll hear from the chorus of administrators because they've all done a great job leading this initiative. Our plan is uh, very thorough and very uh, comprehensive. So Mrs. Zinsky um, has worked closely with Mr. Rampato on the facility side of things. So um, we'll review for facilities things that we already had in place from last year that we're continuing for this year, as well as some of the changes that we've made. So um, as Mr. Belisle already mentioned, we're hiring additional staff to make sure that we're disinfecting and cleaning daily and we're hitting all of our high-touched areas. Um, that's a continuation from last year. Um, the ventilation upgrades, some of these we had last year with an increase in fresh air intake. So instead of bringing in 10% of fresh air, we're bringing in 30%. And we're running our HVAC systems 24 seven. So we're constantly turning over the air with the existing systems that we have in our buildings. Um, we've also last year and again this year, replaced all of our filters with Merc 13 filters, which are a denser filter, which filter more of the particulate out of the air, which is what the virus travels on. And then new this year, we have purchased air purification units or DFS units, and they're in every classroom, and there's two in this room, these black boxes. Um, these filter the air even more than a HEPA filter. So as Mr. Rampato will tell you, a HEPA filter will catch a particulate that's 0.8 millimeters. These filters get 0.07 millimeters. So they're 40 times more effective than a HEPA filter. We have them in every classroom. 
in every office, in every space, and in our large spaces, we have more than one. Um, we've maintained our polycarbonate barriers in some of our high traffic areas, such as our main office, or the lines in the cafeterias that the kids will come through. We did not continue them on the student desks, um, but we do have them in some of the high, high traffic areas. We maintain those. Um, we still have additional hand washing opportunities for kids. It was moved out of this room, but we have hand washing stations in every cafeteria, as well as um, changed faucets in many of our bathrooms, so that there are no touch faucets and they run for 20 seconds to encourage longer hand washing for our students. And then our district facilities, last year facilities indoor and outdoor were closed to public groups. This year we will open them on a case-by-case -case basis assuming that um, anyone using our facilities is following the same protocols that we will follow during the school day for safety reasons. Child nutrition, so the USDA last year made all breakfasts and lunches free for students and that has been extended through June 30th of 2022. So all students, regardless of eligibility, get free breakfast, free, free lunch every day. There's no eligibility requirements. They come in if they want breakfast, they come into the cafeteria before they go to their classroom. Um, in the afternoons, lunches are free as well. Some students will be eating in the classrooms, some will be eating in the cafeterias, but the building principals will talk a little bit more about how they're managing that in each of their buildings. Um, if students are remote, whether they're in quarantine, or if for some reason we have to quarantine or go remote on a classroom or a building level or even a district level, we do have plans in place to continue offering those free meals, both breakfast and lunch, to any family who may want them with a drive-through or pre-order system. And then um, my school box is the system that we've always used for prepaid meal accounts. Students won't need that this year for a regular meal, but if kids want to buy ice cream or when they go through the line, if they want to buy a snack, you can still put money on their lunch accounts and they can use it for those items. Transportation will continue this year. Um, our buses are still being cleaned and disinfected daily. They used to be, um, I believe, once a week and now we're doing it every day. Um, we do ask that parents are screening their children prior to sending them to school. So that means prior to getting on the bus as well. Masks, just like in school, are required on the bus at all times by both students and the driver. We will have assigned seats on the buses, and that's for contact tracing purposes, because students are more than, or less than six feet apart when they're on the bus, riding the bus together. Um, we will ask household members to sit together to try to reduce some of the contact that they have with other students. Um, when kids get on the bus, the first student will be asked to sit in the back, and we'll fill the bus in, spacing them apart as much as we can, but then we will take the um, have assigned seats for all of the kids. We will we'll continue to keep windows open as much as possible for airflow and circulation, and this year we have added a bus to our fleet to help reduce the density on some of our buses that were really, really full. We had probably at least one specific bus run in each of our buildings that was always packed. So we've added a, um, a bus to our fleet to be able to spread those kids out a little more and reduce that density. And just today, I'm happy to say that first student has confirmed that all of our runs have drivers assigned. So there's a lot of news right now about driver shortages. And up until a couple days ago, we were short a couple drivers and we were working on alternate plans. But as of this morning, all of our runs have assigned drivers. So. Great news. Um, we will also continue our before and after school care because it's so important to so many of our families. Before care is at Windermere only. It'll be the same procedures that we've had in the past. Um, parents will drop off at the bus loop and get buzzed in. Um, the after school program is in this building and in Smallwood. JFK has been our provider for the last couple years. So you can uh, register right with them. 
Um, People Inc. is another provider that also works with some of our families for after school care. We still have that program intact, it's just been relocated out of our buildings. And then the before and after school care is available to any student who's enrolled as long as they are in person during that time. So if uh, for some reason a student needed to quarantine or go remote, obviously we wouldn't want them to come to the before or after school program during that time. But other than that, um, it'll be open for our families. Social emotional learning, Mr. Belisle. So you may remember the structure from last year. We've maintained a similar structure for our general SEL plan. Um, so you may remember the MTSS or multi-tiered systems of support framework. Uh, essentially, you remember from years ago, RTI, which are tiered interventions, universal for all students, versus targeted versus more individualized or intensive at the top. Similar to that, on the right you see social emotional learning. We approach things similar in that fashion as well. So we look at universal interventions and supports uh, as we return back to school, as well as generally for all, um, as well as targeted, more intensive support. So our plan is broken down, as you may recall from last year, similarly, and then it's further broken down into students, staff, and families. And then it's further broken down beyond that into subcomponents of remote and in-person. So that, the second, that, Structure of the plan is maintaining, um, as well as an added section for resources that Ms. Ernst pointed out within her group um, on our committee. So some of the highlights for this upcoming school year include some of the increased human resources. So we've been able to hire two support staff for our family support center, one school counselor and one, and one social worker. Those individuals will be work assigned to two buildings each, as well as help support global interventions supports about the district for both students, staff, and families. In addition to that, we have our three new health and phys ed teachers that will be supporting health curriculum as well as phys ed time, one at each elementary and one primarily at middle school, but also supporting some adaptive physical education for our high need special education students as well. They will be supporting, as I said, the health curriculum, but also mental health curriculum as well from that tier one area that you saw down the bottom green area. Secondly, um, I'll note that our committee focused on two major areas, one being engagement, particularly student engagement, as they return back. In many cases, students were out of the building last year and coming back from being on remote all year. And the second was around anxiety. So specific to anxiety, uh, Ms. Kim Morrow is a licensed clinical, clinical social worker out of Erie, Pennsylvania, who's renowned for her support around anxiety, multiple rewards, multiple books, multiple presentations. She's going to be joining us in Amherst to not only support our staff through the suite, but then our students as well as our, our families. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a second, including a, a flyer that you may have gotten recently. Um, in addition to that, we have purchased a set of videos that our PPS staff will be working with under the guidance of Dr. Otto and Dr. Shannon and support the purchase of those videos to support that work. And our PPS staff will be spending time later this week going through those videos and creating support for all of our students not just at the beginning of the year, but then throughout the year, so it's sustained. And those will continue on until future years as well. The third chunk you see here are our general SEL initiatives. You may all recall that SEL time we had built into the day each of our buildings. That will continue this upcoming year with a slightly different flavor in each of the buildings, but that time will continue. Um, the second, there are the SEL resources that Ms. Ernst referenced in her work on the committee. Um, that will be chunked out into essentially monthly, not too dissimilar but to our character traits that we have in each of our buildings. And they are structured in these areas, which I know it's hard to see, but self-management, self-awareness, um, relationship skills, and, and social awareness. So those are some of the areas they'll be chunked, and will be chunked similarly to those monthly sort of traits, and will be aligned to a new monthly newsletter that will come out of our, out of our family support center, which will also be aligned to some of the virtual nights that the family support center provides. So all of that is purposeful in terms of its alignment and support to our family, students, and staff. We also have some new SEL videos that will go in concert with our health and safety videos that we shared out for, again, families and staff. The last chunk you see is really revolves around assessment. So how are we doing? Um, the first you saw recently, I sent out a screening and feedback needs assessment for our families. A similar assessment was actually sent out to all of our faculty and staff as well just day, a day prior. So what we're going to be doing is looking at that information. Our HR department will get the staff information. 
And our PPS staff will look at the student information from a global perspective to see are there any trends that need to address, as well as individualized needs or interventions that need to be in place for, for any individual that reaches out and has them. So that is the work to come. And then of course, the ongoing screening will exist, and I've shared this before as well, through our faster to my savers assessment data. So that will be a screening tool that we will continue. Similar as we similar to how we screen students for their reading, math, and writing skills, we're going to be screening to make sure that they're doing well socially and emotionally. And of course, our own staff is the first screen. Like they know their kids better than anything. But that screen is just one more measure to make sure we don't miss someone who might just be quiet, or is not engaged. So of course our staff is being able to but that those components are some additional pieces we'll have in place for the upcoming school year. I want to just highlight the one on there, and that's our presenter, um, Kimberly Morrow, who will be here again, as I said, later this week for our staff, but then again for our parents and, and then for our students. Um, in addition to those videos we, we pulled from her work, I just wanted to share this flyer. This is a link that I sent out with that needs assessment. So within there, if you're interested, I, I would love for any parent to join. Um, Kimberly Morrow will be presenting digitally through our Family Support Center, and the, the Zoom link is actually attached here on the left, so if you want to register, you just click right here and you can register, and we'd be love, love, to, love to have you join us that night. Kimberly is absolutely fantastic. I think you'll enjoy the information and find it extremely helpful. And I think Dr. Shane is up. So just as Mike kind of was at a 30,000 book view with SEL, um, I'll do the same thing with teaching and learning, and you'll hear a little bit more information as the buildings give their reports. But for the teaching and learning committee, K-12, um, this was our main goal. Our goal was to prepare for in-person instruction with the ability to fluidly switch to remote if necessary. That was a major focus. Similar to the year before, we wanted to be able to flip a switch so that we didn't lose very much instructional time with our students. So this year, um, we're looking at two instructional models because of the reduction of, you know, we can get our students physically distanced a little bit closer than before. So we are looking at an in-person instructional model, which would be all students in attendance five days a week, with a minimum of three feet of distance. They can get a little bit further than that, but we wouldn't go below that. Um, and the other option that we had for our students that might have compromised immune systems or comorbidities, they did have the ability to register with medical documentation through the e Academy through MOSIS. The second model that could potentially be implemented this year with our instruction is a remote instructional model. Same thing, all students would attend five days a week um, and learning would take place again for a synchronous and asynchronous model that we used um, similar to last year. So one of the things the committee worked on and that um, you as parents or, and or our students should see is some similar practices in person right away so that if we do have to switch to remote, we're ready to go and we lose limited instructional time and our students are clear on how to access the information they need. So our two learning management systems we used last year were maintaining, Seesaw would be the, most of the primary grade or Google Classroom is typically being used grades three through 12. Um, we're also using, um, last year, one of the things that the teachers did was they either had one of two things, a landing page that kind of showed what the day was gonna look like, or they put in their Google Classroom an agenda as a tab. So one of those two things, and they'll show the students what they're going to do. The high school tended to use a tab, so, um, and their students negotiated that. They will talk about exactly where the Zoom link will be, even though the link may not be there right away, right? Because we know what happens when we let them out too early. It's not very advantageous for safety. But if we do need to go remote, that link will be put into that space. It'll be on the top of their Google Classroom pages. And they will practice logging in and out for kids that have not been in using those um, tools before. The other thing we asked, the committee thought it was really important that we use any of our digital tools that they might use at home in the classroom a few times so we know they can get in, they successfully know how to navigate those spaces, and they know what those expectations are. So these were some of the big takeaways the committee asked to maintain from the previous year. This is just an example. This might bring back memories. Those teachers, some chose Bitmoji pages. I can see some smiles even around the masks. I can see the corner of the eyes going up. 
Some people want a little more vanilla, but it would still achieve the same goal. Um, and so then the question would be, so we're doing this little bit of practice. Um, when would we shift to remote instruction? So according to the current guidance, there's several scenarios. We could have contact tracing and a class has to close. Um, so a first grade at, I'm looking at Mrs. Plan again, so a first grade at Windermere has to close, right? Or a first grade at Smallwood has to close. That class would go remote. A course could uh, be quarantined due to an infection with the students. Grade levels, schools, or a district. So those are all options where wholesale um, closures we have, um, for in-person instruction would occur and we would have to go to remote instruction. Remote instruction, once again, we're doing five days a week. I shared that a few minutes ago. Um, the elementary has a slight change. Last year we did asynchronous specials, but if they were to close this year, we would be, we would uh, have our schedule so they would be synchronous. So what's gonna happen when the teachers start coming in in this uh, upcoming week, is they're going to be asked to set a schedule that includes their special time in it, and that will then be sent home to the parents. So that will be upcoming and emailed by, um, you know, from classes to the students in those rooms so you would know what the schedule would be. Middle school and high school will follow a bell schedule um, and they always do an hour for office hours on various days if, um, after school is out and that will be communicated um, as usual. Once again, some of the teachers put their schedules in like this, and then the students could see what was live, what was synchronous, asynchronous, um, and this would be a difference. The specials were um, asynchronous, they'll be synchronous this year. So the one thing I haven't talked about, which we anticipate might occur, um, is what if a student is symptomatic or in quarantine or is told they have to be in isolation? If so, each building has a process to follow, and as we go through the presentations tonight, the elementaries will share with you what the process is for a student who has to be out for about 10 days, and the same thing will occur with the middle school and the high school, because the processes are slightly different. So one of our major goals that we've talked about now for a year and a half is how do we support continuous learning when kids are moving in and out of these different instructional modes. And Mr. Belial talked about some of the social emotional supports that we've invested in for our students. We also have some academic ones. So one of our goals for the teacher side is the reason for hiring the teachers is to decrease the number of students with a teacher, but increase the opportunities for academic growth. So we have an ENL teacher that has been added, special education teachers, AIS, and a math teacher to reduce some class sizes. These are all more opportunities to intervene. Last year when I spoke with you, we were looking at there uh, would be a higher number of kids that might need intervention. So you can only intervene if you have enough human resources to do that. So we've added those human resources. So we, I have to say, successfully can pick up everybody that fell into an at-risk area same cut score from the year before, but that's or from before COVID, and that's because we hired people to do that. So we're hoping um, and continuing growth will be the outcome of that. And um, programming is the other side of it. So we can support continuous growth if we um, provide more opportunities to learn. So we had summer school this year, highly successful, um, and really good turnout too. And then during school, we can provide these extra services throughout the day, and then after school, there's after school programming as well. So we're, we're tag teaming two different ways. Uh, summer school, during school, after school, we're getting some programmatic uh, things in place, so or interventions in place, or just extra time working with students. And then we also have, are able to do that because we have the faculty to do that good work. And then lastly for me, technology and connectivity. Some people, and I've gotten some emails from parents about, are we gonna be one-to-one -one again? Yes, we're gonna be one-to-one. -one. Um, the Chromebooks will be distributed in the first um, few days of school. We're asking all parents to sign a user agreement. I think we've now emailed three or four times to everybody, and then we're gonna hit you with paper pencil come the first few days of school. So 
we need um, we need that done. And we also will once again offer insurance that covers everything except for if it's stolen um, or lost. But the it's twenty three dollars a year, and it will replace the entire problem. It's three hundred and fifty dollars. If you have hot, need hotspots for internet access, we can address that. We will keep the Amherst Help Desk, which is our technical support team again. And we also will maintain our Tiger Links, which is the landing page, or the launch page, that the students or even the teachers will come to when they log on to their, um, their Chromebook. And when they get onto that space, that's all the district approved software is located there. So whenever um, this week, we're mapping all those onto the students uh, digital spaces, so once they're registered for a class, any software connected with that is now being loaded onto the student pages this week and the beginning of next week. And then CSOM Google Classroom are also being uh, managed right now as well as our online learning management systems. So we're off to a good start and um, my district and building administrators will speak to this a little bit further. schools have once again this summer collaborated closely to have consistent policies and procedures throughout both of our buildings. While specifics about each building will differ slightly, for example, our building start times, the makeup of each health and safety plan is identical. I'm pleased to once again partner with Mrs. Flanagan, principal of Windermere Boulevard School, to share some of the health and safety teaching and learning and social emotional learning that we will be implementing in each of our buildings. For example, we are implementing our universal masking policy while inside. All four buildings will insist of at minimum three feet physical distancing in the classrooms, hallways, and cafeteria. Students will be required to maintain, maintain six feet of physical distancing with increased aerobic exercise in phys ed class, when singing without masks, or when playing brass instruments in band. Adults are required to keep a minimum of six feet distancing at all times. This includes adult to student and adult to adult. So as you've heard earlier, um, the boss uh, students are going to be wearing masks and we're really going to work really hard at keeping a tight seating chart in the event we need to do some contact tracing. So the teachers are you know, prepared in any way we can to sort of help support those students to make sure that they sit in the assigned seat on the bus. Our intramurals after school and before after school intramurals are still going to happen, although we are going to make sure that we stick to those guidelines, masking three feet apart when necessary. For our field trips, we're going to pause a bit on that. Uh, elementary kids, um, you know, that's like the highlight of their school year and their fondest memories. So a lot of these things we do want to bring back, but we want to wait a bit and make sure we can get our kids into school five days a week, off to a good start, and we will reevaluate that in the spring. Fortunately, for most elementary schools, many of the field trips don't occur until the spring, so that gives us some time. And our arrival and dismissal times have been staggered in order to reduce density of the uh, students and teachers in one area, as well as to allow time for the temperature screening upon entry into the school. Continuing with health and safety, each classroom is both Smallwood and Windermere has increased ventilation with our new portable air filtration systems, the DFS, disinfecting filtration system supports clean and healthy air in both of our schools. The teaching and maintaining of our hand and respiratory hygiene remains a big priority in all of our classrooms. Students will eat breakfast and lunch in our cafeteria while maintaining physical distance seen requirements of at minimum three feet. Our kindergarten students, our kindergarten students will eat lunch in their classroom. Teachers are going to be working really hard planning for both scenarios, as Dr. Shanahan mentioned earlier. They're also going to do a lot of time in the beginning of the school year working with the students, our youngest learners, 
and getting them prepared in the event that we do all have to work remotely. So in that event, teachers are hard at work coming up with a schedule to give to the parents in the event that we do have to work remotely from school. But know that any student that is home waiting for results of a test is out ill or quarantined, instruction will automatically be provided to that student from the teacher so they don't fall behind. Our AIS, our enrichment, our ENL, our related services, we're really pleased to reinstate those back into our elementary schools and provide those necessary supports for our students. As Mr. Carlisle shared earlier, Social and emotional learning remains a top priority in both of our buildings. We are pleased to have additional support staff from our family support center, as well as new health teachers in both of our buildings. I would like to introduce our new health teachers here in the audience, Mr. Anthony DiRenzio. He's the newest member at Smallwood. Welcome, Anthony. He's here with his family. over last year's SEL blocks. The morning meeting is an opportunity for adults to connect with children and support their social and emotional growth. And the emotional health of our staff continues to be essential to the success of our district. Both buildings are planning a number of initiatives to ensure that we take care of those that are taking care of our little ones. And next, we'll turn this over to our secondary administrators, Mr. Pigeon and Mr. Griezmann. Good evening, everyone. As with Smallwood and Windermere, uh, Mr. Pigeon and I have some things in common relative to our plans across the secondary campus, uh, which is also in common with a uh, bunch of what my colleagues from the elementary schools just told you. So getting right, uh, right to it, we have the same rules and regulations around our universal indoor masking for adults and children. Same distancing guidelines, our minimums, of three feet child to child, and uh, six feet between adults and from adults uh, to our children. Uh, COVID-19 protocols, as you know, will be strictly adhered to, working in partnership with the Erie County Department of health. Much like in our elementary schools, we too have the DFS air purifiers new this year, as well as all of the ventilation improving measures we took last year, uh, relative to our MERV 13 filters and air exchangers being on a higher level. We will again uh, train and offer opportunities for the proper uh, respiratory hygiene and washing of hands and sanitizing. And then the caveat of playing a wind instrument, uh, exercising indoors, uh, being more sick, I should say, being at six feet of distance if you are to remove your mask. Adjustments for 21-22 between AMS and ACHS have some similarities. Uh, but, but slight differences in terms of timing. So we will be opening our doors at, at 8.45 and starting home base at 9.01 and back to a 3.45 dismissal. We will have temperature screening at all of our entrances and backpacks and lockers will continue to be allowed. We have 42 minutes coming up this year of uh, great instruction. Water bottles again will be permitted and we are happy to offer our array of extracurricular and athletic opportunities before and after school. Our students will be eating again this year uh, in our cafeteria and our south gym. And our library media center will start to uh, take on some of its original uh, roles as it has customarily, which we are happy about before and after school as well. We have uh, moved closer to our pre-COVID bell schedule. However, uh, we will uh, open the building at 740 like we did last year. Uh, homeroom will start again at 815. And we've increased our instructional time to 41 minutes, decreased our passing time somewhat to uh, five minutes. And we've returned the late bus into the inventory. So we're very excited about bringing that service back to students. 
All of the other pillars you see regarding classrooms, extracurricular, and lunch are the same as the middle school, including the, the library services, which will continue this year as well. We uh, are, are striving, and, and, and all indicators, CDC, American Academy of Pediatrics, etc., is five days a week instruction. That is our goal. Uh, like Dr. Shanahan and Ms. Vanella had shared, our, our uh, scenarios include other scenarios like remote if we need to go to that, and we hope that we do not. And we will do the same like the elementary, like Mr. Vella outlined. SEL continues to be a priority for our schools. We have our one-to-one -one devices, our Chromebooks, which will be issued in homerooms. We're prepared and we are preparing the teachers and they will continue a robust presence in their Google Classrooms, which will have a number of resources, assignments, and a lot of information for students, both in person or if they happen to be absent for some type of re reason. Uh, we will have access to teachers remotely uh, if someone is what I like to call SIQ, symptomatic, isolated, or in quarantine. So we can keep that child tethered to instruction as they uh, continue to recover in whatever situation they are at. And as outlined in a number of slides, uh, we've added a number of resources, a uh, reading teacher, a math teacher, extra support in that area, some point two assignments to spread kids out. Point two is our extra classes that a teacher is compensated to teach. So we have a number of those in place that improve the situation in the building in terms of instruction and spacing. Uh, what do we do if a child is out of quarantine, isolation, or is symptomatic? We want to keep that child very tethered to instruction and connected to the building. No tiger left behind. So if you uh, are symptomatic, we are certainly going to give you the resources information to seek a test if you choose to do that, because that can help hasten your return in, in some cases. Uh, we would encourage you to have your child continuously visit Google Classroom throughout the school day. They can do a lot on their own with these robust resources that we have embedded into every teacher's Google Classroom. So they can, they can follow along as the day progresses. So if, if, if your child is well enough, uh, they should get up, eat a bowl of weed, and start working on Google Classroom immediately. Um, they will use the daily slides and some of those cool agendas that you saw up on the, uh, the slide earlier from Dr. Shanahan. We have added Zoom to the teacher's office hours. So that we've never really kind of done that before. So after school, each teacher requ is required and, and offers uh, office hours opportunities. So that will be an access point for students at home. Uh, we will also encourage them, and they already do this, to check their emails frequently because Google Classroom sends you notifications about an assignment just been posted, the grades been just posted. So there's a lot of information that kids can continue to access during the day and in the evening. Uh, we've also added a access point during the school day. Our teachers will open another tutoring session during the day during one of their conference times. So you'll have two access points to your teacher while you're at home during the course of a week. Those cobbled together will give you a lot of access to teachers, and it's critically important, especially in the secondary environment, that they're accessing their own teachers. So we have that built into our systems to keep those tigers tethered to the instruction if they happen to be home in an S, I, or Q protocol. Oops, wrong button, sorry. And uh, finally, uh, SEL, as uh, Mr. Bella had adeptly shared, will continue to have those supports. Uh, our, our, uh, our FSC, our Family Support Center staff, is very familiar and connected to our building. Uh, we will use our home base and home rooms for those SEL activities and wellness-themed events and uh, uh, mental health-related uh, events as well as having um, mental health week weeks. We had a tremendously successful mental health awareness week, and we will use our students to kind of lead in many of those efforts in a leadership effort. And we are done. Um, so questions. Question.
So I mentioned, you know, I didn't expect it to be here at this point this year. Um, however, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else given the circumstances that we are facing. This leadership team uh, has done a phenomenal job putting together the plan that you just heard about. Um, not only, um, you know, working diligently to put together drafts, but also facilitating with our stakeholders to make sure that there's buy-in with the plans and there's good communication around the plans. Um, so I'm very proud of the work that they've done and the, the leadership they've demonstrated. Um, I, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that this is a working document. This plan is fluid. We, we don't expect school to look the same way in June as it does in September. So we're going to continue to monitor and adjust. And our goal would be to get back to normal, as normal as possible, as soon as possible. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're being safe and we're keeping our doors open for in-person instruction five days a week. So we will constantly be revisiting the plan and reviewing it and um, adjusting. Well, thank you. I appreciate your attention. Um, one of the other, the last thing I just mentioned that you saw, I think in the presentation intentionally, the commonalities. You know, again, that speaks to our leadership team. Everybody's collaborating, everyone's working together, and everyone is on the same page, which is why you see threaded throughout that presentation um, the consistency of the commonalities. So great job, team. That we will need a motion for new business items. I'll make a motion for new business items E1, A through G, 2, B through E, 3, C, D, E, F, and H. We have a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor of approving new business items E, 1, A through G, 2, B through E, and 3, C, D, E, and H, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Ms. Castelli, do we have any follow-up action items? Yeah. And we will need a motion to convene to executive session. I'll make a motion to convene to executive session with our employment. A second? All those in favor of convening to executive session, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, everybody, for coming.